Okay, cool. Oh, hi, everybody. We now have come up to a really juicy topic now that we have worldview, motivation, and speech lined up. We're ready for realistic, ethical, evolutionary action. <laughs> and this one, I, I'm a little... Do I have a little pride about it? Maybe. I never think, I don't think anybody ever thought to put the theory of karma next to Darwin's evolutionary theory. I think that uh, people who do translation of Buddhist thing and or people in Buddhist cultures, they're in a way, they're too, they've been too intimidated by the so-called greatness of materialist science to think that some sort of thing that involves a mind or even a soul, a reincarnating soul, <laughs> would, would have any bearing on anything, much less on something scientific. Meanwhile, the philosophical ethicist, you know, philosophy in a branch of philosophy is supposed to be ethics, you know, right? Metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics are sort of the main uh, branches of, uh, supposed to be the main branches of philosophy. And uh, they never thought that ethics would be involved with a biological theory. And this is simply wrong, because that's precisely what karma is. Now, in scientific theories, a great deal has to do with observing reality, finally. You know, experience, experiment, you know, evidence. That's science. And biological science is observing how bodies behave. In, in the biological science in America and in the West, you know, Euro-American, but now global uh, materialist science, science constricted by materialist dogma, they only look at the body, so they look at the chromosomes, they look at the genes, and this only, the body's genes come from the two parents, which combine. And then there's this really weird thing called epigenetic uh, environment, which is all kinds of other things, which uh, have a lot to do with how bodies are formed. And uh, the gene is it's always the, the Western materialist thing, trying to find the active causal component, but then there are so many conditions. <clears throat> and then... Because Darwin was a tremendous observer. And don't get me wrong, I like Darwin. Uh, I especially got to like him since I read a wonderful poem about his biography by a lady poet uh, in England um, who was very sympathetic to him and observed him very fully and did, wrote a beautiful poem about him and how as a child he observed every kind of bug and species and anything didn't want to be a surgeon doctor as the family wanted him to be, and instead became a, um, you know, evolutionary biologist and um, did a great job in the sense of disproving the nonsense about humans or something that came from God and then animals don't have minds and they're not sensitive. And, I mean, so all kind of back, barbaric, backward Western ideas. And... <clears throat> and um, sort of tribal ideas, he overcame them, and he noticed the sort of connection of humans genetically with all kinds of animals, things like that, really wonderful. However, Buddha preceded him by several thousand years. Buddha maybe and colleagues, Buddhas, the different Buddhas in India, around the time that they escaped from the gods, which was uh, in the middle of the first millennium before the common era during the axial age, when they took the causal uh, circumstance driving the character of, of human life away from the Vedic gods who you appeased through ritual sacrifices and offerings, and then they, they helped you out. And, and that's what caused what, you know, uh, your results in a life. Uh, not what you did, but what the gods favored you with or, or cursed you with. And when this was taken away, uh, Buddha took the causality of life away from karma, which meant ritual action. 
in the earlier Vedic period, karma meant causal action of, of affecting your life through being doing rituals and getting the gods to favor you and not to curse you. And uh, Buddha took that away and he said, no, the cause of what happens to you is your action and what you do in life. You kill people, you become like a paranoid person, and you know you, you live by the sword, die by the sword type of ideas. Uh, you know, you're a thief, you become poor, you're a, um, et cetera, you know. And um, you commit sexual misconduct and you become ugly. And it goes on like that. That's sort of the simple level that we observe in life, actually. And then the Buddha noted that uh, because he became conscious about his own death and um, he, learned, he observed the mind through the process of how the mind attaches to the body, how the mind has its own causal plane, very super subtle. You, it, you know, it has a material always analog. It goes along with energy, which is material. Uh, and um, in one way, you, you could reduce it and say it's all matter, but just mind is super subtle. You could say it's all mind, but then the coarse level of mind is matter. I mean, you can do either of those. The more convenient thing is to think of two things, mind and matter, mental physical and mental. But uh, they're, you know, that's all arbitrary ways of describing an inconceivable reality. Okay, finally, Buddhist science never is dogmatic because reality is inconceivable and unca meaning uncapturable by conceptual formulae, sort of laws, uh, concepts in general. Although concepts are immensely useful in steering this inconceivable life, from a person who's alive. <laughs> and so it's not that they are not useful, it's just that they can't capture what, what, what actually happens in life is beyond, and the fact that anything happens is beyond explanation ultimately. It's kind of a miracle, okay? And maybe ultimately nothing does happen even. We would go so far as to venture. And somehow if you know that while things are happening, that they're illusory and really nothing is happening, and you deal with them in that way, sort of like the matrix kind of situation, that may be the best way of dealing with life. Who knows? Uh, that's what Buddha decided and taught, and many people confirmed subsequently. But in any case, while you're dealing with the causal processes in the illusory relational life, which may be the only one there is, indeed, is the illusory relational one, uh, the way of doing it is better to be nice to what's not you, what you perceive as other than you, rather than to be at war with what you perceive as other than you. Because after all, what you perceive as other than you, as, as, as an individual being, again, relationally, just call it individual, because you think you have a boundary and you're different from some other thing. It's not that it's indivisible. It may be analytically divisible, may disappear under analysis like relational things do. But still, you experience it as individual. And the way to be, and then the, the other is so much more than you, and you can't really win in a war against it. Even if you become a king, even if you become a god, you still, there'll be other gods, you know, there'll be more, it's infinite, you know, endless, and, and, and perpetual also, timeless, beyond time beyond end in space and time. And uh, that was noticed in that time by Buddha and his fellow Buddhas in the Axial Age in India. And so he came up with a biological theory that your mind shapes your body life after life, much evidence for the re rebirth of beings and that nobody gets away from it. Once they think they're an individual, they'll always keep being, being one. And uh, they, once they lose a the body, they'll find another one. And um, they, in other words, once they go into super subtle, just energy embodiment, they will seek more coarse energy embodiment if they're used to that, and so on. So then, so then suddenly what we find is this wonderful and an elegant byproduct. So therefore, right, first thing, karma theory is not an absolute dogma. It's re relationally a very good like law of behavior and law of causation, but it's so it's very effective and very useful, and it has very elegant 
elements to it and very good side effects. But it's not an absolute dogma. If someone can finally disprove it, be our guest, you know. Find out that there's no nothing at all going on, whatever. But uh, so far, it's the best way of accounting for what can be observed and the presence of oneself in past life and therefore, by implication, going to future life is uh, observed. It's not a, a superstitious thing. People remember previous lives. And you can't explain that by just saying it sort of came from the air or it's a, it's a fantasy or whatever they actually remember. They recognize people. They know what their names are. They know where they live, etc. very frequently, especially as children, especially in cultures that don't discourage that by telling them they're crazy or that's not possible and so forth. And so people do. So anyway, so then we get the idea. Now, in modern ethics, they have this idea because of materialism that ethics have nothing to do with you. you. And even a great genius like Wittgenstein said that, well, ethics is just your choice. It's your free choice. You decide to be good. And, and actually, of course, in sort of legal level, if you're ethical, you'll get along well with other people, and maybe sometimes you'll be abused by them. But you will, that will happen even if you're unethical, of course. You'll have honor among thieves, and then thieves will rob from each other. You know, in other words, uh, uh, but you observe that ethical behavior generally leads to a happier life. People have fewer enemies, more people like them. When they're nice to the other people, ethics being mainly don't harm other people and uh, help them if possible. You know, that's mainly what it is. Because you don't want to be harmed and you like to be helped. And that even mentally, you like to be liked or loved. You know, you don't want to be hated. Physically, you don't want to be beaten. You want to be, like, caressed and so on. That's, uh, that's just obvious. And that this, this then becomes the causal, part of the causal processes that determine your quality of life and even your quality of embodiment. And it accounts for the difference in embodied beings. Like two brothers will be very highly different. Even twins will be different. And that's accounted for by their past experience being brought forward in sort of seed form in a kind of seed, subtle uh, continuum of their conscious evolutionary process, something like that, something like that. So that what, the other nice thing about that then is in the Darwin thing, all, all the good that you do or the effectiveness that you have in your evolutionary niche, if you're a giraffe, you can eat the higher leaves, then later beings the whole, as a species, they start having longer necks and they eventually become a giraffe and they eat high up in the trees. So they don't compete with animals, they can only eat the lower leaves you know, of trees. You know. and, uh, but, but you don't get the fruit of that yourself because you just you don't have a mind. It's just a physical continuum of, of energies that would, and, the, and the mechanism is the super subtle gene that was only discovered recently that creates a pattern that then you, your body adopts a form like the form of your parents. Okay? And that, that's not, we're not, and it doesn't involve having to deny Darwin's observations, which are valuable and excellent in regard to the physical aspects of the human embodiment in a specific environment on this planet. They're very useful. And in general, the principle would be inferred animals on other planets might behave in another way in a different kind of environment. And that's all good. But that an individual will seek a form that was like a previous one, and or that might be was a bit better if they had problems with their previous embodiments, or a bit worse if they got confused and thought that having some kind of lower intelligence but bigger physical body might be better for them if they died in a fighting or something. You know, they'd be more about, okay, gorilla would be better than being a human wrestler if they spent their life wrestling. <laughs> Meanwhile, then, gorilla is considerably less capable than a human in dealing with their environment because of our intelligence and our shared speech and language and things, which uh, is not obvious why we would evolve toward that is very mysterious, possibly. But the key point is what we do drives our evolution. What we do with our body, coarse body, drives with our evolution. What we do with our speech body, so you, people have a kind of language body, 
drives our evolution, and what we do in our super subtle thought body drives our evolution. So you have body, speech, and mind, and ethical acts. You have the famous tenfold ethical um, pattern of skillful evolutionary action or unskillful evolutionary action, which we would call virtuous or unvirtuous, and people in other languages also translate it as virtuous and vicious. But, you, but the, the Sanskrit word for virtue and vice is skillful, unskillful. And it's called skillful. The word kushala has that, also that second meaning, and, or first meaning in, in general language. And the reason it's skillful is that you're, evol you're skillfully navigating evolution when you're good. So then you're virtuous. You get it? And you're unskillfully doing it when you're vicious and you get more in conflict with what's around you. And your embodiment deteriorates because of that. So suddenly, ethics has an evolutionary grounding. Isn't that wonderful? Now, if you think about it, ethics under theism, you're just obeying a rule by an omnipotent being. So that's back to being controlled by the gods. You're rewarded for good action or you're punished for bad action, right? Hell, then in hell, right? Then, in evolution, you have no point in being uh, you know, ethical, except in immediate getting along with your immediate circumstances. But there's no ultimate purpose, because whether you're good or bad, you're nothing after you die. So that's why ethics becomes detached from your biology, because you have no personal dog in the fight of your life. <laughs> it's you don't have a mind, and you don't have a subtle mind, which we could call a soul. And Buddhism is famous for not having a self, but that only means that you don't have a fixed identity, either at a subtle level like a fixed soul or a fixed coarse body identity. Coarse, per, coarse body personality going along with your coarse body. You know, I'm a, I'm a human with two legs, two arms, five senses, a mental sense, etc. Thinking about my five senses, etc. <clears throat> so this is the marvelous thing. Now, therefore, karma should really be translated as evolutionary action, or even in a general term, it's evolution, because it's the cause and effect, the causal process of life. Uh, but the uh, Buddhist life includes life and death and relife, because death is part of life. Death is a transition in life between bodies. And it's very scientifically settled, and I even love, I have, I even, don't worry, I'm not, uh, I don't freak out because it's not a dogma, but it's a based on observation. And I love even the book, and I'll recommend to you a book called Spooks by a woman, Mary something, I think, wonderful, which is trying to ridicule the former future life and belief because it so much undermines materialism. And so she, her, the purpose of her book is called Spooks, she ghost in the machine, you know. She's trying to ridicule it. But when she goes to India and, and observes firsthand some of the children who do remember previous lives and they go somewhere and recognize everybody and they tell them where the fit, where the hundred rupees are buried in the in the adobe wall in the village and so on. <laughs> because they were grandma in the previous life. And when she goes and went on a few of those, and she did admit that she was somewhat impressed by that, while she had been ridiculing all kinds of experimental attempts to prove former future life. She ridiculed. But those she was impressed by. But then she said, but still, I can't get it. I don't get it. Whatever the final explanation will be of what definitely seemed like someone who remembered previous life. But I don't get it because nobody ever told me a mechanism. But the karma theory explains to her the mechanism. She simply didn't do her research. But I still recommend her book to you so you can see the radical case against rebirth or reincarnation. We call rebirth when it's just involuntarily done. A person who hasn't examined their unconscious, they just die and they're driven by their instincts toward another form of life because they're used to being in a body. And... Um, and they don't, they're not happy in a sort of matrix realm. It's everything very, very changeable and unstable in the subtle level. It's very, very highly unstable. It's like your own mind. You have a fantasy that you might be like this, and then you immediately forgot about it. You can't even visualize it because your mind is so unsteady. So the bardo, the between states, between bodies are like that. And so beings look for a more stable-seeming coarse body 
in the after the between states, and they get what they look for. But then we call it reincarnation when someone consciously has kind of overcome those drives in the sense of one has become conscious of those uh, energies and has has been able to move the energies away from just seeking a greed goal or seeking a hate goal or seeking an envy goal or seeking seeking an arrogance goal. And they, but they have those energies that are underlie those emotions, those um, addictive and and destructive emotions. And when they when they therefore consciously seek rebirth, oh, I like that family, I like that mom, I like that dad, I want to go to that country, that village, that culture, that era, and they travel like that. And then they can consciously choose a rebirth for the benefit of themselves and others. And that we can call reincarnation. There are different levels of ability to do that. And their final idea is that a Buddha can incarnate simultaneously in multiple bodies, which in, in, it's funny, in India, uh, although they're not, in the last seven, eight hundred years, they've not been that familiar with Buddhism, and they have thought Buddha was maybe a form of the god Vishnu. But nevertheless, they regularly attribute to the gods like Vishnu, Krishna, Shiva, these people, that they can multiply themselves and they can manifest an entire army of other beings, just created, you know, uh, because, they, because they have that kind of creative ability. And they even, of course, they have one creator god, Brahma. They will, some, some of them do, some of them, or Vishnu, they will say they're the creator in general of the whole world and other beings. But they don't, but in a way, they have a karmic awareness and they, so they're back to theism, but yet they kind of have a feeling that ethics and karma are interconnected uh, because I think the, the, the axial age, enlightenment era of Upanishads and things kind of give you that feeling, even in the Gita, you know. Okay, so even under theism, they give more agency, in other words, to the individual than the Western people do. Than, than, and materialism gives you no agency because you don't actually exist. Everybody's a biological robot carrying genes for a species. And the species is not an intentional creature anyway. It's just a category. And the genes are just like little little viruses or they're little codes in viruses, you know, or in bacteria or whatever. So it's all just a mechanical process. Not fully understood, but they plan to fully understand it eventually, somewhat. Although, they, although on the other hand, since it's material... And therefore, it's quantities that they're looking at, and they are dawned on them that the universe may be infinite, endless, then they may never finish counting it. <laughs> Realistic ethical evolution. So that's my preliminary to this very, very important, actually foundationally important topic. It's also foundationally important because a being that becomes enlightened does not escape from karma or does and doesn't. They do escape from karma in the sense that they achieve a realization that nothing bad is happening, and they feel really blissful and happy. And in a way, you know, everything has already happened or something. I mean, it's indescribable what happens to them, what they achieve. On the other hand, they have a, this incredible, since they become like a giant cloud of a being, where they experience themselves as everybody else. They become totally empathic to all, of, all life. They become a being like that. Then they feel other beings suffering as the other beings feel them, any being that's suffering. And so they want to be compassionately interact with those beings. And to do that, they have to interact ethically. There's a wrong idea that an enlightened being can be unethical as they can do anything they want, they can do this, that, because they're all good. But the point is, because they're all good, they don't do anything they want. They don't have any want that is harmful to any other being. They absorb all of other beings' wants, and they are good to all of them. They try to help them fulfill their real wants. But like Bob Dylan sang, they somehow not necessarily give them everything they want. They rather more want to give them everything they need. So they don't confuse those two. We sometimes, when we're greedy, we do confuse what we want with what we need. And like we'll become bloated with overeating, well, you know, we'll overdo, you know, addictive. We become, it becomes addictive. Life becomes addictive. And we harm ourselves by being over greedy and so on. Okay, so 
So that's why this is such a key thing. It's a realistic ethical evolutionary action. Now we have the distinct pleasure of turning to a breakthrough insight by me. <laughs> of course, it's by Buddha. But the point is, in the modern period, in tangling with Darwin and with the Western notion of biology, to bring karma into relationship to biological causation, that's how I did that. You know, other people think that's so, oh, some crazy Buddha is trying to superstitiously do this, reject our wonderful science, and people will criticize me like that. They do. They will. On the other hand, if they're rational, if they're philosophical scientists, and they're rational, they can't avoid it. In fact, biologists nowadays are writing, Buddhism is right. Somebody wrote a, a book like that. Buddhism is right, a biologist. Then he said, oh, don't mean, that doesn't mean I think former and future life are right. Oh, that doesn't mean I think this and that. No, 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 I'm a, I'm a modern scientist. I'm a materialist. So, but Buddhism thought of as materialism is right. <laughs> because I observe how the mind works and they seem to understand it better than we do. This, well, of course, we know mind is epiphenomenon of brain and they don't, but they know how it works better. So in that sense, Buddhism is right. So Buddhism is right if it's not Buddhism, in other words. <laughs> it was a best-selling, it sold well as a book because there's a lot of interest in that. And I haven't written this. Buddhism is right and Darwin is right when you do Darwin plus. Or Buddhism is Darwin plus. I could write a, I should write a book like that. I'm just too lazy, too old and retired. Okay, so turning to a breakthrough insight that reveals the Buddha's achievement as a biological scientist. I did write it here, but I could write a whole book out of this paragraph. Maybe I will, and I should. Shakyamuni Buddha as Super Darwin. <laughs> I love it. I really do. I am pleased to stand up, because he only adds to Darwin that there's a mind, there's a subtle energy level. We can call it energy. Actually, for materialist scientists, the transition between energy and mass, or matter, is also incredibly problematic. If they say they don't know the mechanism how mind, thinking of it as non-material, might interact with material matter, and in the sense that then leads someone to take rebirth, uh, they are skipping the problem of how does energy relate to matter? <laughs> well, all they can say is that somehow when, when matter explodes, Horribly, it releases energy. It turns into energy. E equals mc squared. Mass multiplied by a square of the speed of light. And the speed of light is not even a number. It is a number, but that's a ratio. Because it involves uh, space and time. So 186,000 miles per second, is it, I think, or per hour, per second, I can't, I can't remember. But, but that's a ratio involving position in space, or trajectory in space, and time, okay? So how do you multiply a, a quantity by a ratio? A huge one, 186,000, the number 186,000 squared, which would involve a mile, if it's a mile per mile per second or per hour, and a length of time. It actually seems like a very simple thing, but it isn't, and that's why they're running around, oh, we got the Higgs boson. They found a particle, they think, that accounts for, makes, makes it logical to reach mass out of energy. And the huge energy, they accelerate it in the second trial and they smash an atom, and then they see where it goes. And then they infer the presence of something that didn't dissolve under analysis, that wasn't infinitely divisible into its parts. Give me a break. And then meanwhile, what's the dark matter and energy doing at the micro level there? It seems to turn... It's, they notice that it must must be there to turn galaxies. It's ignoring subatomic particles, dark matter and dark energy. 
they are so confused. <laughs> so it's just as problematic to them to try to explain how energy and mass relate, you know, as it is to how mind and matter might relate. Especially if you become more sophisticated, as philosophers did become, with Frege, Saussure, Wittgenstein, Derrida, about, about uh, uh, word and language and reference, how language relates to objects. And they began to realize that language, in some sense, creates objects. <laughs> Partially so, but inexplicably ultimately so. <clears throat> so they, have, they are doomed, the materialists, to overcome that dogma. They're doomed by their own intelligence if they really be, become more better logicians. They're doomed. So don't worry. I am pleased to stand up scientifically, logically, and philosophically, although those should all be synonyms, actually, for this transformative understanding. Because, you know, that you learn, you become a scientist just by blooping something and observing some chemical reactions and learning some pattern, some laws of chemistry. And you don't learn to be a philosopher and decide what is a law and how to numbers and how to language react, relate to materials. And from a philosophical point of view and logical point of view in your thinking and reasoning. To see simplistic, like, for example, the idea of a catalyst used to be traditionally stated that a catalyst was something involved in a chemical reaction which, which changed the objects around it but didn't change itself. That used to be a dogma in chemistry, I believe, at some time. Of course, I may be wrong. Somebody tell me. I'm, I, I haven't, I don't remember it, so I don't bother with it, actually, so much, you know. So I was always felt, felt very suspicious of their sort of dogmatism. But, you know, whatever they did, but I know that used to be the case. But then if you go to the sub-micromolecular level, what is, a, what is some substance? It's molecules, it's atoms. And then they they affect the behavior of other atoms, and they don't yet they don't change at all. It's absurd. It's absurd. They can't interact with something without being changed. Even Vasubandhu completely rejected that <clears throat> when he rejected the idea of an indivisible atom. Fifteen hundred, eighteen to seventeen hundred years ago. Buddha rejected it 2,600 years ago. For this transformative understanding, which gradually dawned on me over the decades it took to deepen my appreciation of the Buddha's scientific acumen. And why, why did it take me decades? Because I was conditioned in this culture. In this culture, all oh, science, you know, that's I would, the building would fall down on my head without science. <laughs> so... Conditioned to think of it as something special and new. Okay. As my trust in Buddha has grown painstakingly due to my own subliminal embeddedness in materialist culture. That's it. And we are like that. I know a lot of people who say, oh, yeah, I believe in I was previous life, I was Cleopatra or I was Julius Caesar or something, you know, Beethoven <laughs> or Matahari. You know, and, but meanwhile, they still don't think they really have a future life. Not really. They don't live as if they do. So that's because they are embedded in materialist culture, instinctually and subliminally, so unconsciously. My skeptical turn of mind, my conditioning to expect the worst of everyone and everything, my fear of success and real happiness, whenever I've had a whiff of total bliss, it has frightened me too. My enthusiasm for investigation has intensified my, tr my reasoning has sharpened, and I have understood things he taught in new and deeper ways. That means I've more and more gradually and, and energetically and with effort, and but not just meditatively, but also meditatively and realizationally, broken through being dogmatically gripped by the consensus culture that's just all, only matter matters. And there's no non-material thing that matters. 
which is our consensus culture. I can't even believe how I didn't see it before, that karma was ethical. I have come to respect the power of the unconscious blocks to my understanding of reality. So the unconscious isn't just some seething cauldron of like negative energies as Freud thought. What, partially what makes them ne those energies negative are concepts that are negative, like I hate so-and-so, or I want to eat such-and-such, such. I want to abuse so-and-so, I want to dominate such-and-such. Such. I'm so great, everyone else is so horrible. How dare they be happy? These are, these are conceptual underpinning, like the, the, the unconscious subliminal operation of structure, conceptual structure in the unconscious, which is why it's not that easy to those of us, those in the yogic world, in the art world, in the psychedelic world, you can blast free of concepts at the time, for a time and get into the swirling energy of your, of your, you know, boundary mental physical level, but you don't necessarily just by having a peek outside of the conceptual structure that has you subliminal hold of you subliminally as well as consciously. It's not that easy. You have to learn the range of it, and you have to you have to cultivate these this deep, deep insights and so on. So I have come to respect, and we should all respect the power of the unconscious blocks to our understanding of reality, and realize that our culture doesn't understand it very well. Our scientists don't. They le they learn enough to manipulate this and that piece, and then they are doing so. And because they're of their overall incomplete and imperfect understanding, they're manipulating things destructive to our environment and ourselves, even. Okay? Not so long ago, His Holiness the Dalai Lama wrote a little book on secular ethics. I knew he was doing it to help the many people, such as hard scientists, who are allergic to religion. Because people would think, that their own religious ethics was God told you to be good, so you be good, or God will throw you in hell. And they didn't want to get back into that. And I don't blame them, and neither does Dalai Lama. So good, at least they're being secular. <laughs> they're not just doing it as being obedient, you know. Okay. When I complained to him about his use of secular in the title because of its anti-spiritual connotations, you know, because of my own view about that, he disagreed with me, saying that secularism in India is respectful of religion. So that is a difference. And Indian used that because of India being such a spiritual country. When they made their constitution on a on a modern uh, democratic way, which may well turn out to be an ancient Indian city-state democratic way as well. As in other words, not only Athens, also the Indian city-state. This will eventually be discovered, I think. So therefore, democracy has roots universally in many cultures, not just the Anglo, Greco Anglo, Greco Anglo culture. <clears throat> but but anyway. So there, secularism means that you don't say that the country is a Hindu country, the country is a Muslim country, the country is a Christian country. You don't say it. You say it's a secular country, meaning we're just dealing with what's happening now, and uh, religions are part of that, and, but we don't prefer one over another. So separation of church and state, secular kind of meant then. And in a way, it does here too. So in a way, he was wrong. I was wrong to complain so much because I was not maybe conscious of the power of the fundamentalists in America over the last 40, 50 years, how deep, how powerfully they've researched. There's a fun book in America called Cultural Creatives, a um, uh, sociological book that shows that in the last, since the 60s, last 60 years, there has been about 55 million people who call themselves, who are what he calls cultural creative, or they call, I think it was two writers, cultural creatives and uh, who do yoga and they're interested in other traditions. They, have, they like spirituality. It's a you know, new age and this kind of thing. And uh, it's interesting that during that same period, 55 or 60 million people left 
old line Protestant churches and joined evangelical communities and thereby undid Darwin and un, you know became creationist and became re -resur trying to resurrect an old fashioned anti scientific theism. And it's a very powerful movement. And so for those secularisms <laughs> And in a way, you can see secularism as a kind of religion, a, a, a kind of spirituality of humanism, which, has, which is like religion, actually. And then there's fanatics, secular. Communists maybe become fanatic secularists, and they actually burn down churches and things, so that's like a destructive kind. Uh, and there are, some, there are some people in the, Mar in the capitalist world who are also like that. But anyway, he's right to bring up secular. I really like it. It, it's, a, just a, it's a good ground for ethics in the, sense of, in the sense of he doesn't say compassion is good because Buddha said so. He says compassion is good because I observe mothers and babies and humans. And we understand how a being comes to be human. And it goes with intelligence, compassion. It goes with the ability to empathize with others and so on. So it's observed in nature rather than Buddha said so. And Buddha will be punished you. So Buddha never claims creatorship in that way, very importantly. Okay. So when I complained to him about the use of secular in the title because of its anti-spiritual connotations in America, he disagreed with me, saying that secularism in India is respectful of religions. And uh, secularism in America should also be respectful of religions. And, and religions should go back to being respectful of secularism, indeed. Conceding that it implies pluralism in India, I still insisted that it had anti-religious connotations in the West. So I was being, because we have this, we will argue with each other, me and so on. And sometimes I win the short term, and he wins long term. <laughs> Here is the case of him winning long term a little bit. <laughs> okay, okay, Your Holiness, I get it, I get it, I get it. Concerning, conceding, and it implies pluralism in India, I still insisted, because we're having trouble with pluralism here with these Christian nationalists, these Christo fascists in Russia, and so on. I still insisted it had anti religious conflicts in the West. Though he held his ground, ultimately he called the book Beyond Religion, and then put kept secular ethics in the subtitle. To my relief, I resisted his using the word on the cover in America, even though it was my most revered teacher's idea. But that's Buddhist, that's the way Buddhist scientific minded wisdom oriented people are. They that's part of the guru student teacher student relationship, guru shisha relationship, is at some level the, the good guru welcomes discussion, debate, questioning by the student. You know, in Zen they talk about Dharma combat with the Roshi. You know, and that's a sort of legacy of that element in the Buddhist university, the great Nalanda, Vikramashila, Ratnagiri, Balaba, etc., Balabi. And, uh, and uh, it's not just an authoritarian thing, in other words. After some time, it, became, it came to me that he was rightly resonating with what the Buddha himself had done in his own era, repeating it in the context of modern thought. The Dalai Lama might not have known that himself, analytically or historically, I should say maybe, as in his present life he has not studied the language of the Vedas, Sanskrit, ancient Vedic, which is even different than modern Sanskrit. He knows a bit of modern Sanskrit, I'm sure. And their Sanskrit commentaries. Here's the key point. Because before the Buddha's time, karma did not have the present Buddhist meaning he gave it of the causal, intentionally committed ethical, unethical actions that give transformative results in the future life destiny and the quality of the actor. You know, they give these results. But even in this life, actually, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So there will be causal results even in this life of your ethical actions. But, uh, but, uh, but the more important one is in future life in the sense that it will involve this helping, relating to the design of the embodiment that you seek in, from the between state. So it will give a transformative result in the future life, destiny and life quality of the actor, of the agent. 
In Vedic terms, it meant action in a ritual, a ritual aiming to placate the Vedic gods. In fact, actually, I should be, I'm wrong, actually. His Holiness could have known that. I'm actually being able to disrespectful here because actually the word karma and the Tibetan translation le can actually mean ritual action, still. So karma can mean, you know, ritual karma still in both Sanskrit and things. So it's only an added meaning, ethical action, evolutionary ethical action, from the axial age in India and then later in Tibet. Okay, okay. You're convincing me more, Your Holiness. Okay. In Veda, it meant to placate the Vedic gods, since it was a ritual aiming to placate the Vedic gods. So that's what karma meant. Since it was believed by the Buddha's Vedist contemporaries that the gods controlled beings' fates, action in the sacred ritual that placated them and pleased them and induced them to provide a good result for the acting person was considered the powerful destiny-determining action. They called such ritual action karma since they thought it determined the person's fate. Although even then, they knew that karma also meant physical action. But the Buddha, when he realized how life causality, i.e. biological causality, works more realistically, understood that individuals in the ocean of infinite relativity determine their fate and transform themselves by what they do, their relative selves, by what they do in ethical or unethical actions, not only bodily actions, but also speech actions and mental actions. So instead of the gods controlling your destiny, you control your own destiny by how you act in environments and situations with body, speech, and thoughts in your mind. Because people of that time thought of karma as the word that as the word for destiny determining action, he took the word out of that religious context and used it to refer, additionally, I should have said, to secular actions that impinge on the world and others around one, ethical or unethical actions that give rise to good or bad results, respectively. So this is how the word kushala can mean either virtue or skill. That's very, very interesting. So the old reading still stays there, which is in like the case, that's the way language is. In English, if you look in the, in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll find meanings one, two, three, and four, and the current temporary one will be sometimes four, and then the other ones will be called archaic, and they meant different, in other words, things, words meant different things, but in a way, somehow they still have the, some connection to the pre in some cases, to the, the current temporary one. So that's interesting. So secular ethics is good for you, Your Holiness. So Buddhism, in that sense, is secular in relation to Hinduism. It was secular in relation to Hinduism. So Buddha was behaving secularly, looking for better life results for himself and his, and his subjects, because he was supposed to be a king. But he said, rather than be a king, I'm going to be a teacher of a new teaching about the way of conducting your life and developing your mind and educating yourself. And I'm going to do that not in terms of what the Hindu priests want me to do. I'm going to do it in, based on secular observation of life. So your holiness is just living up to Shakyamuni there, and I didn't appreciate it as well. That was very good. Mm. Thus he took the attribution of destiny determining power away from the gods and their attendant religious priests and their sacred rites and revealed it to be a secular matter of an individual's actions in the world. He also was kind enough to come up with a secular ethical description to help his contemporaries improve their actions and their lot in life. Just as the Dalai Lama, clearly Shakyamuni's worthy successor, here I'm here I acknowledge it, was kind enough to do the same thing for today's scientists and secularists. And I would say even religious fanatics. <laughs> Although, you know, the religions do have uh, ethical, their ethical things do kind of generally tend to, uh, to follow patterns or to recommend, let's say, patterns of, act patterns of action that improve beings' lives. That's why religions have lasted long, 
because their education told people to be nice to your neighbor, love your neighbor in various ways, you know, like be, be, be ethical with them, Judaism, love your neighbor and Christianity, and be ethical and compassionate to them, Islam, and then be follow the laws of Manu in Hinduism and follow Confucius' ethical laws in Confucian Taoism. So they wouldn't last if they didn't correspond to how human beings conveniently can more conveniently get along by being kind and nice to each other. So that's the thing. So His Holiness is just trying to broaden people's perceptions of things and to have the scientists become observed things in, in a more spiritual way, put it that way. So therefore, and India did that, and therefore they did have and do have spiritual science. However, the theism problem can be the one that West in a way broke through to some degree, and that's why His Holiness liked that, which was that, you know, if someone feels that God wants them to, since one thinks that the goodness and badness of things comes from what God made out of them, then one will kill for God by becoming a fanatic. And that's no good. You know, then that's overriding. Thou shalt not kill, in fact, that God said. But beings, humans, can misinterpret them that way. And actually, I actually think that the great teachers, the Moseses, the Jesuses, the Muhammads, the, you know, Vyadnya Valkya, the Patanjali's, the Buddha Shakyamuni's, the Confucius, the Lao Tzu, the great teachers' teachings were too often codified in texts, and the texts were interpreted in commentaries and changed by people working for kings, for authorities, who wanted to frighten their people and wanted their people to be willing to break the basic laws of humanity about killing and so on, when they wanted to conquer some place or do something. So they corrupted, actually, the traditions, I think, in general, and made them authoritarian. The great teachings were really liberating human kindness and intelligence, and that's why their teachings lasted. And, and, uh, and, uh, and th those are the aspects that enabled the religions to encompass beings that would have wanted to kill each other as tribally by expanding the definitions of everything. But then still there's a final tribalism between religions that the, that the corruption part in the religions can, you know, has created where you could have Muslims killing Jews mercilessly, or Christians, or Muslims killing Jews mercilessly, Jews killing Muslims mercilessly and Hindus killing Christians, Christians killing Hindus. I mean, they can they can behave badly again under things where they think some absolute power is is behind their egotistical, negative, unskillful evolutionary act drives, and that's where we are, we are today. But that, that's another topic, but anyway. So, yeah. So, right. Thus he took the attribution of destiny-determining power away from the gods and their attendant religious priests and their sacred rites and revealed it to be a secular matter of an individual's actions in the world. He also was kind enough to come up with a secular ethical description to help his contemporaries improve their actions and their lot in life, just as the Dalai Lama Clearly, Shakyamuni's worthy successor was kind enough to do the same thing for today's scientists and secularists. Long before Charles Darwin, Buddha observed that humans have a total kinship with other animals, all beings having minds and ever-changing souls, super-subtle energy minds, including beings that Darwin would have considered spirits or fairies, and a huge zoology of subhuman beings, as well as deities, angels, and devils, the numerous types of deities have varying degrees of knowledge and power, although Buddha argued, agreed with Darwin that there is no one omnipresent, omnipotent one, no supposed absolute creator, capital C, who you can blame for all the problems in life. <laughs> what 
And that's why Brahma, the, the, the deity in India in Buddha's time, who was considered the creator and still is subsequent in many places in, in Hindu India, uh, Brahma liked Buddha because Brahma was happy to, that Buddha would tell people that he, Brahma, was not to blame when horrible things happened to them. When, you know, when, when terrible things, when they lost their life, when a tiger ate them, when their tiger ate their, their son or their daughter or their wife or their husband. In other words, when terrible things happened, when people, when a neighboring tribe came to kill them all or something, you know, bad things happened. And they, God didn't want to be blamed for that. And the, the omnipotent, a God in whom, into whom omnipotent creatorship is projected by humans cannot evade being blamed when horrible things happen. Sorry. So when some religious fanatics go and kill members of, of other religion on, the, on that basis, dehumanizing them on that basis, what they are doing is they are actually showing their lack of faith in their own God. Because if their own God didn't like those beings, he wouldn't have and shouldn't have created them like they are. He didn't create them so you could become an unethical person and go and kill them in a genocide. Certainly not. So when a being commits genocide seemingly legitimated by religion, they are showing their lack of faith in the omnipotence of that God. He did a bad job creating, and he created these beings who are subhuman and we have to kill. And he told us not to kill, so we're doing bad things when we kill. So he put us in a bind. So even he didn't know how to treat us. So we don't really like him. We pretend to be so faithful. Oh my God, God, God. But actually, we're not. And we kill in his name, or her name, or its name, whatever. So that's Dalai Lama's challenge to humans who, who want to do religious war. That was Tolstoy's challenge in his book called The Law of Love and the Law of Life, where he has a little girl challenge the archpatriarch of Moscow. Why, why can he go bless the troops to go off and fight the Turks? Why? What does he think he's doing? God wants everyone to live and love their neighbor. What, what's your problem? He challenges the high priest of Russia, the little girl in Tolstoy's book, the author of War and Peace, was when he saw the light. <laughs> sort of. So Buddha deserved the profuse, this profusion of life more directly than Darwin did, simply by remembering in the moments just preceding his complete enlightenment that he himself, in his beginningless past, had personally experienced countless lives in every conceivable animated life form. So, not, you know, because Darwin was not in a tradition where you had both deep introspective learning from previous great realized beings, and then you had meditation, like Descartian level type of meditation, like a philosopher and looking how your own mind works. And finally, you had realization of how your mind shapes your behavior and shapes your shapes, actually, and, and interacts. It's part of the epigenetic surrounding of genes, and genes are a useful structuring of molecules to carry codes that the mind does at an almost unconscious way. Like a mother in the womb doesn't consciously sit there and design a spine hands and fingers and toes and, and folds of the brain and, and you know, really complex anatomy of a baby based on some tiny little code. That's a miraculous event. It, but she doesn't consciously go, okay, DNA says LGBT, BTL, LGBT, reads the code and then, then comes up with five fingers. It doesn't do that. But her body does. Her subtle energy mind does do that. And it totally unfolds from those codes. This amazing creature, like a human being, um, you know, 10 month old human being, comes out, pops out of the womb. Well, she has to pop it out rather strenuously, <laughs> unless she's a real yogini or a, or a heavy duty agricultural worker who can expand those passages so dramatically. So, so resiliently and flexibly. So it's very hard for her to do it. He was utterly astonished. The Buddha was, I'm saying. 
But, that, but that's why I'm putting in that climactic moment. But it's very likely when Buddha looked in the mind and got into the subconscious in his own meditation long before that final time, he gradually, bit by bit, opened up his awareness. And he did remember already previously. It was just a put it in the story that he did it all in one huge infinite rush where he became so vast and infinite and he realized he had been and he became empathic therefore with every single other kind of being that existed. So an inconceivable experience, absolutely. So in his beginningless past, had personally experienced countless lives in every conceivable animated life form. He was utterly astonished Quote, he says, I was one of those in such and such a realm, such and such a planet, such and such a species, occasionally human, in such and such a country, such and such a family, with such and such a name, etc., etc., and one of those over there and one of those others too. He re quote, unquote, he remembered having been not only human many times, but every other kind of being as well. And how could he remember that suddenly so wide open? I, 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 I'll come back to that. Uh, so amazing. Because he sort of, it just became like this vast, vast sensitive intelligence beyond the, the, the previous body. Buddha, with his super subtle micro-consciousness, would also, super subtle micro-consciousness, would also have been aware of the interconnectedness of species through various super subtle structural codes, which we only recently discovered and now call DNA and RNA, etc. As we probably will discover more things about that even within them as we go more and more subtle. And when we and when we use the mind to explore it even, and not just machinery. Because we well we use the mind even through the machines too, but we develop that kind of high magnification mechanism inside our own consciousness. He no doubt welcomes them and other discoveries of recent times. I purposely use the present tense, as I will explain in the context of his Buddha verse, by fun term for the more usual Buddha land or Buddha field or Buddha or pure land, which is what they use in Buddhist tradition. But he is more interested in the codes of action by which an individual of any species can shape her or his or its own destiny while transmigrating through various embodiments from life form to life form. So it's like a third brand of DNA, but which comes from other previous parents too. So in other words, there's a, you know, I, was, I, will, I must write that book called The Third Gene, because in a way, the being that comes from the previous life in a super subtle body-mind context which is what they call it, even though it's in, they say it's all indescribable, but they do call it that. And that super subtle body-mind must be dragging the equivalent of things that can interact with the DNA of mother and father, in the case of, say, a human being, a mammal. And so there's a triple chemistry going on. It's not just the, the mother in her, in her super subtle mind-body doing it, building that, there's also the third one of the being who has come from the previous time. Really interesting. And it's at a much more subtle level, and a level where the genes are much more universal. It's, you know, like the thing about chimpanzee of 95% of the same gene as human. Well, then that means could mean from previous life, chimpanzee could be reborn as a human. And they would bring, they would bring DNA like that, and, the, and then the, that would influence maybe the human being to be a little chimp-like in their monkey behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. Could be. Could be, could be. And we may discover these things at the super subtle plane. So Buddha, with his super subtle micro-consciousness, would also have been aware of the interconnectedness of species, through various super subtle structural codes, which we only recently discovered and now called DNA and RNA. He no doubt welcomes them and other discoveries of recent times. Oh yeah, but he is more interested in the codes of action by which an individual of any species can shape her or his or its own destiny while transmigrating through various embodiments from life form to life form. 
the natural reality of the former and future lives of beings fits with the law of the conservation of energy, that no energy is created from nothing and no energy utterly destroyed by becoming nothing. So those two expressions, created from nothing, becoming nothing, is, our, of course, misuses of language from a philosophical point of view that any scientist can see. So that's the law of the conservation of energy. It merely changes form and can both dissipate and, re, and reconnect and recombine. The human mind and subtler spirit are some sorts of energies, however subtle, or they can go along with some sorts of energies. You can express it either way. This is the common sense belief of everyone, really. So why should that subtle mental and super subtle spiritual energy be the sole exception to the thermodynamic law of the conservation of energy? The body eventually becomes worm food and soil if you inter it in the earth, and heat, smoke particles, and ashes if it is burned in fire and they themselves become something else. So why should the mind not have its own level of subtle energy continuity as a natural process, not anything particularly supernatural? So that's why I never use the word supernatural. I call it supernormal. Because, because, because mind and energy are always interconnected. And energy is kind of the bridge the bridge quant, ent, quant entity, the bridge entity. We think of it as an entity because we have a word for it. So it's the bridge entity between mind and matter. If you make mind by definition non-material and matter by definition non-mental, then energy is sort of somewhat mental, somewhat, somewhat uh, physical. And this is along the line of where, although they say the, in, the indestructible drop, which we could call the soul, is in esoteric Buddhism, or the mental continuum, which you could call the soul in exoteric Buddhism. It, it always has an embeddedness in some sort of super subtle energy. And in the great, the great philosophical analysis by Dharmakirti, where he, where he uses the idea of, of causation and conditioning going along by entities in kind, he says there's a mental in-kind continuity and a physical in-kind continuity, and the physical can't create mental and mental can't create physical. But there, he doesn't go on to say, as he did as a tantrika, which I'm sure he did know himself, he doesn't want to say at the super subtle level they kind of interconnect indivisibly. But, and, because, and that's somehow inexpressible and, and uh, ineffable. That gets to the level where reality goes beyond dogmas and formulas and laws, and it is inconceivable and miraculous. Okay? Natural, not anything but supernatural. As I mentioned before, when I was a recently ordained monk, sitting quietly meditating in the New Jersey Monastery Chapel with a candle in the middle of the night, and actually getting into a nice state, my dear Geshe-la suddenly came into the room <laughs> and interrupted me, switching on the overhead light. He asked me what I was doing and blinking in the black, bright light and somewhat irritated, I said, what do you mean? I'm meditating, of course. I'm trying to attain enlightenment. He scoffed, oh, don't bother yourself. You can't attain enlightenment. You're an American. <laughs> I was more annoyed and said, what do you mean? I'm a Buddhist monk. I totally believe in former and future lives, and I'm certainly going to attain enlightenment. Never mind that I'm an American. He persisted. No, no. It is the mind that attains enlightenment. And Americans don't think they have a mind. <laughs> he That's what he persisted. I continued to protest, and he laughed. And having interrupted me, as usual, he invited me to have some yogurt in the monastery kitchen, as usual, at that hour of the night. I continued to argue with him about this for weeks on end. But then I finally had to recognize that in my unconscious mind, deep down, my deeper conceptuality, 
by education, not spiritual education, but arts and sciences, Western arts and sciences education, if you will, my material reality education had implanted in me a strong certitude that only matter existed. I, in a way, I only matter mattered, I should have said. And of course, convertible into energy somehow, but that no non-material entity, so-called mind, could possibly exist, could possibly matter. So I had to admit that Geshe-la was absolutely correct in the way he challenged me. And I still don't think I can bend a spoon. <laughs> I don't think mind can influence matter because it's, it would have to be material to influence matter. We'd have, so therefore, we have the bridge agency of chi, of energy, of prana, you know, which is not only breath. It's like breath or it's like oxygen metabolism, oxygen carbon metabolism through breathing and ex exhaling. But it's, and so that's at the subatomic level, at the level of quantum form. What is that? We don't really know how to describe it even, much less really understand it. We don't. So somehow, we, we, language makes us unconsciously inherit an idea that mind really is non-material. And therefore, we don't feel responsible for mind. And we don't feel powerful in our agency of mind. And I still don't. And that's true. So, so, you know, consider the core misknowledge that causes all pain and suffering is a certain sense an unenlightened individual, such as me, has of her or his utter separateness from all otherness in the universe. The obvious worst-case examples are the lifetime spent in the hells, the nataka, horrific zones within which beings unsuccessfully try to ward off the most hostile otherness. I re I'm glad I wrote this here because I recently saw this film on Dante, this documentary about Dante. Wow, did that ever grip people? Buddha's biology uses a scale to classify life forms that runs from the extreme of separateness in hellish shapes and environments to the extreme of inclusiveness known as Buddhahood, where one experiences oneself as inseparable from infinite others. And Godhood is very close to that, actually, although strangely, the last steps from Godhood to Buddhahood seem very difficult to, from, for gods to do because they get so complacent in the Godhood. It's interesting. But what separates them from Buddhahood is they feel, still feel some degree of subtle otherness from beings, whereas Buddhas feel they're infinite and they are all other beings. They're not isolated in a heaven in some way. You know. A Buddha identifies, uh, yeah, except for a Buddha identifies with all beings and experiences her or him or itself, because a Buddha can be an inanimate object, actually, if that's helpful to others as one with all unenlightened beings, as well as all other enlightened beings. She, it, he, thus does not therefore destroy or abandon anyone in the past, present, or future. It, he, she, thence naturally and automatically functions to liberate unenlightened beings from their pains by helping them destroy their own pain-causing delusions, whatever it may take and however long it may take for them to do that. And such help is spontaneously delivered everywhere with maximal efficiency by means of limitless emanation bodies, what she calls nirmanakaya. It solves a lot of things, this inconceivable yet dissonantly acknowledgeable idea. I like that. That's not bad. Good writing, Bob. Dissonantly acknowledgeable <laughs> idea of a scale of being from most alienated, marking everything as other, to most unified, as is the case in Buddhahood. It is a departure from conventional wisdom to realize that Buddha's karma theory is scientific, not religious or mystical or even spiritual, as if opposed to material. It's a sophisticated, elegant, biological, evolutionary theory accounting for the way in which the lives of beings are shaped. Karma is introduced in all of the Buddha's teachings, especially illustrated in the Jataka tales, the legends, Avadana, the original just-so stories, Itivirtaka, and in the scientific 
philosophy instructions such as the Karma Sutras and the Abhidharma texts. Buddha understood life directly through his own experience. He remembered his own infinite past. He knew that beings need to make sense of their lives in a realistic way in order to thrive. By using their opportunities as human beings in a skillful and fruitful way, he was very clear that theories about relative realities are only relatively true or false. That's to say true only in a context and that which is changeable and relational, therefore can never be made into absolutist dogmas. Thus, in addition to their practical factuality, their elegance and usefulness are also part of what makes them relatively true in specific contexts. In this way, the Buddha promulgated a theory of evolutionary causality of individuals' life processes, as well as species processes, that attributed to the subtler energies of the mental and spiritual an important role in the biological evolution of living beings. I think that's enough for today. I mean, that's enough for this session. It's over an hour and about an hour and a good place to stop. And quite an amazing thought. So it means, you know, like when you if, you, if you invite someone to come into your house in a very graceful way, that's sort of a beautiful gesture, like with a hand, you know, that's sort of like, please come, opening your hand to them, which has always a such feeling of you're not holding anything away from them. You're giving to them. It has a generosity kind of, you know, expression, the hat hand gesture, and then moving it like as if you were carrying them with you, you know, inviting them, rather than, okay, come on in, <laughs> or like some kind of jerky thing or nodding the head, you know, you know, which indicates sort of not really bringing them in, you know, and not making a gift to them to come in because you're a host who wants to have the guest and so on. So, so that act is evolutionary. It, it creates the tiniest little causal wisp of a shape, a beauty, a beautiful shape, a handsome shape that sort of becomes attached to your genetic code that you and your epigenetic environment for your genetic codes that are going to then contribute to another way of embodying yourself. And it might even contribute to how your health works now and how, you, how your blood flows in the hand that you did this to rather than this. I mean, who knows? Actually, a little bit the Taoist Qigong people and Tai Chi people a little bit know, I think, the way they move. It's really quite, quite fabulous. Anyway, that's all for today. And we'll, we'll come to that in specific detail in the next one. But, uh, you know, I got through a few pages then, up to page. So so that's the way that I came to do that. And I repent. I, I also want to repent, Your Holiness. I think some of my arguments with you, I thought I was absolutely right, but I wasn't quite right. You had a little deeper way you were going with it long term, so you kind of went out with me. I have to concede, even the way we like to argue. <laughs> I'll admit it. I'll admit I think you are right with secular here. Absolutely right. I was not so fully aware of, the, of what, what somebody calls uh, Christo-fascism rising in America. Okay, lots of love. All the best, everyone. See you next week or whenever. Okay, bye.